So now we go to a second risk theory to accommodate behavioral findings. That was weighted utility introduced by Chu So Hong. So here's the formula. We have a lottery given the outcome XJ with probability PJ. Now the formula of evaluation is as follows. Well, if it were this, it would be expected utility, but a new thing comes in a function F. So every utility of XJ, then there's also the weight FXJ an extra weight besides probability that's added. We would like eight to sum to one, that's a wise thing to do. So let us normalize. So all the weights are in the denominator so that total sum of the weights is one. That's usually, you need to do that for good formulas. This formula defines weighted utility. And as I already said, if there were no F or if F is constant, saying that it drops, then it will be expected utility. But then F need not be constant. And uh, it's positive, I should say that. Now you can use F to give higher weight to some outcomes than to other outcomes in this convex combination. That's how you can generalize. The most common case is pessimism. That means low outcomes receive more attention than high outcomes. That means F is decreasing. So then in uh, every convex combination, when you evaluate the lottery, you pay more attention to the lower outcomes and the high outcomes. So you come out relatively lower. That's empirically the prevailing case more than any other thing. There's much intuition in this formula. I already told you a moment ago, I showed you already prospect theory. I told you it's the best theory and I think it is, but clearly prospect theory has also weak points. It is not the ultimate perfect theory. Better theories will have to be invented. Maybe new generations, maybe you guys can do it. Therefore, it's good to know what alternative formulas there are. A weighted utility, people don't use it much anymore nowadays, but it has some strong intuition, some strong value. Maybe part of it can be used by one of you when you invent the new theory that will give you the Nobel Prize. Anyway, so it's good to also know about the alternative theories. So one thing is it can accommodate the delay paradox that it can do by assigning much weight to the bad outcome zero. For instance, uh, so that F weight of zero is very big. And uh, for the other things, it's not so big. That's how we can do it. And I do an extreme case to illustrate. Imagine that F is 100 at zero, and it is one everywhere else. We only talk about gains, let's keep it simple. So then that means the outcomes 10 million and 40 million that appear in the LA product, they just have weight one. Only the zero outcome is over. This is a very extreme, very extreme simplistic case to it is just to illustrate how it works. Let's assume that you tell this identity to keep it simple. And then I'll show you how it can be done. So here are the preferences of the LA paradox. Now some calculations are coming, quite like before. The weighted utility of the upper prospect is just utility for 10 million, so that is 10 million. The third equivalent is then utility inverse, but just 10 million, of course, that's trivial. Second lottery, well, it's going to be smaller. The weighted utility now here, because here the F function is coming in and in a non-trivial manner. So you know, in the above, F which is one, but now here, for the zero outcome, the F function is 100. Therefore, in this convex combination, you have much more weight is given to zero than to the other outcomes. And this, well, this, of course, this is too extreme, but something of that is realistic. Whenever a lottery, there's some zero outcome, people pay more attention. Oh, I mean, I mean nothing. People pay special attention to it. So this is capturing some intuition, some psychology going on in the human mind. Anyway, the effect is here because much more weight to zero than to 40 million. The value under this theory is going to be quite small, especially let's calculate the third equivalent that's clearer. And we see the third equivalent is only 1.54 million euro. So imagine this is 40 million, 80%, and the third equivalent is that small because this zero outcome is getting so much attention, pessimism. So you have strong, it leads to strong zero aversion. The moment zero comes in, get a lot of attention. So you will get much more negative about uh, the whole lottery. So this brings a lot of aversion. That's what you see in the formula. And that's how you see the mathematics and the psychology. It's nice to see how they go together. Here you see it. Now we go to the lower prospects. This one, the weighted utility. Again, you see the formula. 
And again, the F function, the blue comes in. Again, there's a lot of weight for the zero outcome. That's why we get also the 30 equivalent is of course 0.033 million. It's really small, you know, this is 10 million quarter probability, okay? And then, so it's such a small set equivalent because of the strong certainty, uh, the strong zero aversion. The last lottery will have a bit of a bigger value, we'll see. Again, here we see the much weight for the zero outcome. Again, like in this one, the second, the third, and here the fourth, all of them are hit by that zero aversion. The moment there's a zero outcome in the lottery, it gets a lot of attention, a lot of weight, things are bad. So the third equivalent is only 0.1 million. Here we, are, here we have it, it's only 0.1 million. Now you can also see how weighted utility is accommodating the lake paradox because that strong zero of a version, the two lower lotteries, it's working the same way. It's pushing both down a lot, but it doesn't really affect the comparison between them much. So the 40 million decides here that you like the lower one. But in the upper situation, this strong zero version is hitting on that lottery, but not this lottery. This lottery is safe from it. So that means that the upper lottery it gets a sort of privileged treatment. And that's how it can be that preference reverses. And in the upper situation, you prefer the upper preference, or the upper lottery, sorry. I think there is some real, I talk with many students, also many of you, how you thought about the LA paradox or the arguments you had. Many of you in this choice situation, if there is no zero outcome available for the upper, then you really like it. You say, I'm sure I'm not to get zero, so I like it. The moment zero comes in, you like it much less. So in that sense, many of you were paying a lot of attention to the zero outcome and this theory can capture that. So there is a valuable psychological insight in the theory. There was a behavioral foundation using preference condition. The main preference condition for this theory is called betweenness. I'll show you how it's defined. So prospects are now probability distributions of money, lotteries. If we have a prospect X is preferred to Y, then every mix of the probabilistic mix, I defined before what this means. So every probabilistic mix of the two in preference is between those two. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, if you have a lot, you get either X or Y, one or the other with some probability, you will like that somewhere between X and Y. A very intuitive condition. It's weaker than independence. You can see, if you remember the independence condition, this is in fact the independence condition when only uh, independence condition considered three lotteries. And if there are only, if two of those three are the same, then you get roughly between us. So in that sense, it's a weak inversion and you can check it out and I will not explain more, but this is weaker than independence. So it's weaker than expected utility condition. That condition, there's another condition, I will not define weak substitution, Anyway, those conditions hold if uh, given a uh, weak ordering and continuity and monotonicity or the usual things. These are the two important conditions in the behavioral foundation. They hold if and only if the model holds. So I told you before this first version of prospect theory didn't have a behavioral foundation that could have been a signal that it was, uh, there were some problems. This theory did have a behavioral foundation. It was published 1983, a little bit later. And later it turned out already 82, John Quigley had published something that would tell it, but it was not known for a long time. So for a long time, this was considered the first uh, deviation from expected, so the first behavioral variation of expected utility with the preference foundation. So people were quite happy with the theory in the beginning. Nowadays it's not so popular, but still I think it's good for you to know and I explain it. Also, this theory, it could satisfy, I told you before, this origi first version original prospect theory, it was violative stochastic dominance, which is not good. This theory could satisfy stochastic dominance. However, only unbounded domains, not if unbounded utility, and it can be seen it violates. Okay, so it's a little bit not 100% nice, but okay, it's quite uh, not so bad in that regard. Still, the theory hasn't become very popular because there are some drawbacks uh, that it has relative to prospect theory or other things. Usually when data fitting, it just did not fit the data as well. So empirically, you, know, you see where the model, how close are they to data? It never did do very well. Not bad, but also uh, prospect theory was better. 
it can, for instance, it cannot accommodate the coexistence of gambling and insurance. That's one of the things. And also this function is it's less psychologically convincing than probability rating. Because I think it's very natural if you want to model risk attitude that how people feel about probability should play a role. This theory does not do it. It's about utilities, how people feel about outcome, but also the F function depends on outcomes. How people feel about outcome. Nothing is done with how people feel about probability. And you feel that as a psychological theory that wants to capture what goes on in human brains, should think about how people feel about probability. So in that sense, speaking uh, intuitively or so, uh, you know, that models should fit with what goes on in reality, the theory is not 100% plausible, less than prospect theory. You can see that so generated immediately from this. So the theory never became very popular. But I must say that this pessimism that depending on outcomes, you can weigh some outcomes more than others. There's a lot of intuition in it. There's something valuable in the formula still. And maybe when the ultimate theory yet to be invented comes, maybe by one of you, it may use parts of the ideas of weighted utility also. So it surely deserves attention. And that's why I explained it. But now we go to the next theory for a God's disappointment version that has been very also popular, second popular in the next to prospect theory. That will be in the next recording. <laughs>